Well, good morning and welcome to our online services here at Pinion Hills Community Church. I'm Pastor Michael Thomason, and I am so excited to be with you this morning. But before we get started, I've got three quick reminders for you. The first one is that we are multi-streaming. That means we are broadcasting to uh, Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, and phcc.church slash live simultaneously. So if you have any problems with the stream that you're watching right now, be sure to jump on one of our other platforms. The second thing is to be engaged. Uh, you can download today's sermon notes at phcc.church slash resources, or you can follow along on the Uversion app. And third, share this message. We have a unique opportunity to use the technology that we are using right now to make what God's word and his love go viral. And all you have to do is like, comment, and share this stream. Now, I, I want to start off by reading a parable with you this morning. Now, a parable is a, a short fictional story that Jesus would use to uh, illustrate some kind of uh, moral or spiritual principle in, in terms that his audience would understand. And the parable that we're going to read today is the parable of the workers in the vineyard found in Matthew chapter 20. So let's jump right in. Uh, Jesus says to the disciples here, he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing around here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only for one hour. They said, you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And then Jesus tells the disciples, so the last will be first and the first will be last. So this morning, I, I want to talk about how we respond when we feel like a God isn't fair, uh, particularly by our standards. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about my family. I've got an awesome little family who are probably at home uh, watching the stream on the couch right now. I have a beautiful bride, Jade, and we have two awesome dynamic daughters. We've got our oldest, Paige, who is a month shy of four years old, and we've got uh, our youngest, Piper, and she is two years old. And so being almost four, Paige is in this season where she has strong opinions and she has the vocabulary to voice those opinions and she's got so many questions. So, so for those of you that don't have a preschooler or for those of you that need a reminder, um, I created this diagram for you to kind of explain what's going on in her head and what's going on in other preschoolers' heads. So let's jump to that. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, there, there's six main quadrants here and, and, and those quadrants are questions. So many questions, like I said before. There's also a sixth sense for when parents are trying to relax so they can prevent it. All my parents, they understand that. Uh, there's hunger, not for meals, for snacks only. Uh, there's the fun little mystery rage part of their brain. Uh, yeah, that's fun. Uh, there's farm animal sounds, which is always entertaining, and Disney songs. So if you are the parent of a preschooler or, or you raise children, you totally understand what we're talking about right here. This is what I'm dealing with. So because of her moving from this toddler stage of her life to this preschooler stage of life, uh, Paige's mom and I have been um, trying to rethink our tactics for raising and disciplining her. And one of the biggest fights that we struggle with with her is getting her to sit down and eat a meal. 
uh, believe it or not. So, so you see Paige, it's not that she's not hungry, but she loves to snack. She could down a bag of potato chips. She could eat sweets all day, all the junk food in the world. But you make her a nice home cooked meal and you put it in front of her, there's a good chance she's gonna pretend you're trying to poison her. It's insanity. So one night while, while mom was away with some friends and dad was in charge, I thought I was gonna make a decent home cooked meal to the best of my ability for the girls. And so I steamed some vegetables and I served it uh, with some rice. And I thought, man, all right, Paige likes this meal. She eats this meal occasionally. And if I can get her to eat it and get them down, I'm gonna be a hero for the night. So I, I prepared this food and I presented it to Paige and she was not having anything to do with it. And um, so she, she jumps up and she immediately tries to go into the pantry and get a bag of potato chips. And so I follow her in there, I take the chips, I tell her to get back to the table. She runs into the other room and finds a candy bowl and she starts trying to eat some chocolate. And so I walked in and I had to start getting a little harsh at that point. And I said, Paige, if you do not put down that chocolate and go eat your dinner, you are going to time out. And long story short, she ended up in time out with chocolate melting down her chin. And, and so I, I took her to her room and I set her on the floor and she's just standing there staring at the ground, looking defeated. And I'm standing at the door looking at her and I heard her utter these three words under her breath. That's not fair. I thought to myself, you are three years old. What do you know about the topic of fairness? And, and, and when the anger finally subsided and my adrenaline went back down, I realized why she actually said that. She said it because we are all born with this innate feeling, this feeling that never goes away, this feeling that sometimes even gets worse the older that we get. And, and that feeling is this, when we don't get what we want or when somebody else gets what we want, or we don't think our life compares the way we want it to to other people, we just wanna stand in our room and cry, that's not fair. Now, maybe you're at a point in your life, you're in a season of your life where things really do not seem fair. Maybe they're not fair. Maybe you're growing up or have grown up in a household where you experienced abuse and you had to watch uh, people around you grow up in these families that had love and peace in their homes. That's not fair. Maybe you were discriminated against because of your age or your skin color or your gender. That's not fair either. Or maybe you've worked your, your tail off at a job for years and, and this new guy just comes in, works for a few weeks, and he gets the promotion that you thought you deserved. That's not fair. Or maybe every single relationship that you've ever had has ended in this toxic disaster while all your friends around you are getting married and starting families. That's not fair either. And when life's not fair, we're tempted to, to equate that to God not being fair because we think if life's not fair and God is all knowing, then he must not be fair either. And then we, we, we start to feel frustrated and bitter and even angry at God. But here's the thing and here's the bitter truth. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God is fair. Now it says that he's, he's good. It says that he's right, it says that he's just, and he is all of those things, but never in the word of God does it say that God is fair. But I think it's important to understand one thing. God does love you. He does love you, and he shows no partiality in who he has a relationship with. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, it says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That means it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how much money you've made. Nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus. So if you want to have a relationship with Jesus, all you have to do is ask. However, God is not a God of sameness. And what I mean by that is there are no two people on earth now or ever that God will interact with in the same way. You see, we have, all have our own experiences and our own talents and our own gifts from God that he uses to interact with us. We are all uniquely made for a unique purpose. Because of that, we, we are going to experience life differently and it won't always seem fair to us. What fairness is from our perspective is not necessarily what God sees as right and true and best for our lives. Now, one of the things that Jesus is talking about in the parable that we just read is this issue of fairness. And he's explaining the nature of the kingdom of God and how it doesn't really fit into the cultural context that we have here on earth. And so Jesus, he begins to tell this story of a landowner who owns a vineyard. And this landowner needs to find workers to work at his vineyard. And so he goes down to the marketplace to go find some people to work it. At this time in history, 
Uh, the marketplace was a place where, where workers could go and gather, take the tools of their trade and, and try to get hired. They'd go down there and wait for somebody to hire them for work that day. And if they didn't find any work, they didn't have anything to take home to their family. So the landowner, he goes to the marketplace at six in the morning and he finds some workers that are waiting for work. And, and the landowner makes an agreement with them that if they work for him for one day, that he will pay them one denarius. And so they agree and they go to his vineyard to go to work. So later that day, nine o'clock rolls around and the landowner, he goes back to the marketplace and he finds this group of workers and they're not doing anything. And so he says, hey, come and work at my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so the workers agree and they go and they go to work at the vineyard. And again, at, at noon, at three o'clock, the landowner does the same thing. He goes to the marketplace and he finds these workers that, that are waiting for someone to give them a job and he hires them and tells them to work on his vineyard. And then one more time, five o'clock, one hour before the end of the workday, he goes back to the marketplace and he sees this group of workers who aren't doing anything. And even though, again, it's an hour before the end of the workday, he goes to them, he says, hey, why are you guys sitting here not doing anything? And they tell him, nobody hired us. That's why we're not doing anything. And so he said, okay, hey, come and work on my vineyard. It doesn't say that they talked about any kind of payment, but I'm sure these guys are like, there's one hour left in the day. We got to get what we can do. So, so let's take it. So at the end of the day, the landowner goes to his foreman and says, all right, gather up all the workers and line them up. I want to pay them now. However, I want to start by paying the guys that I hired last first, which was kind of a strange thing. Typically, you would pay the people that you hired first and that started working first first because they've been out there for longer in the day. They've done a lot more work and it's an opportunity for them to go home first, but he doesn't do that. And so he starts with these five o'clock workers and, and these guys that, that showed up and worked only an hour, maybe less, they got paid first. And the landowner, guess what he gives them? A denarius. He gives them an entire day's wage just for working an hour. And so as he's going down the line of these guys, these workers that show up, these guys that showed up at 6 a.m., they're thinking, well, if those guys worked here an hour and got a denarius, surely we're going to get paid more. And so the landowner gets down to them. And what does he pay them? One denarius. He pays them the same as everybody else. Now, remember that this was the agreed upon amount. This was the terms of their employment. But still, these early birds, they began to grumble. They began to complain. And they started saying, we worked hard all day. And these guys showed up right at the very end. And you paid them the same. And they said those three words we've been talking about. That's not fair. Isn't it funny how we can receive a blessing and, and, and immediately turn around and measure it? I think we do this all the time. I know I do this all the time. You know, when I get the promotion, uh, when I get uh, to experience something amazing, when God answers one of my prayers, I, I'll turn around and I'll say, thank you, God, thank you for this. And I'll immediately turn around and start comparing it to somebody else. In one breath, we can say thank you to God. And in the next, we criticize how he distributes his blessings to others. But here's the thing. You cannot measure and be grateful at the same time. You can't measure how your life compares to somebody else because the minute you start to measure, you take your eyes off of your blessings and you immediately turn them to the blessings of another person. So if your target is fairness, you're always going to see what you didn't get. You're always going to see the unfairness in life. You will constantly grumble every morning when you wake up and every night before you go to bed. So back to the parable, Jesus says that, that the early workers, they start grumbling that the, that the landowner has made the five o'clock workers equal to them. And that's kind of interesting I, because I think a lot of us have bought into this lie that the more we do for God, the more that he should do for us, the, that the less we sin and the more we pray and the more we read the Bible, the more that God should shower us with his blessings. And sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes I feel like that 6 a.m. worker. I feel like, hey, I feel like I'm in a good place. I feel like I'm doing good things. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sinning less. I'm cussing less. I'm reading the Bible more. I'm praying more. I, I've got my life figured out. And I slip into this mode where I think, God, I'm holding up my end of the deal. I think it's time for you to hold up yours. And when we live life that way, work just becomes about getting paid and not about the fact that we get to work in the vineyard. We get to work in God's kingdom through everything we do. We begin to live a uh, life that way. And, and, and we see a relationship with Jesus about getting a blessing and getting blessings 
and not about being a blessing. We find ourselves in a place where uh, we believe that if we do more, God will do more for us. But here's the thing. You cannot earn God's blessing. You can only receive it. God is not sitting there evaluating your performance. God is looking at you and saying, can you be faithful in the vineyard? Can you be faithful with the uniqueness I gave you? Can you be a blessing to those around you? Can you make the world, my creation, a better place? Can you just take your eyes off of yourself for one moment and focus them on me? So when the landowner, he he hears the grumbling from the early birds, he says, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. You agreed to work for a denarius. That's what I told you I'd pay you. We had an agreement. Did you not agree to those terms? I feel like God is saying, didn't you agree when you said yes to me that you were going to do things my way? And didn't you agree that when you said yes to me, you were going to trust me? Have I not paid you back by giving you hope in your life? Did I have I not paid you back by giving you peace and strength? You see, we too often say yes to God and then we want to change the agreement later. But we're happy and we're excited to be in a relationship with him. But as time goes by, we start to believe the lie that we've earned everything we have, that we deserve it. But we want to change the agreement and say, all right, God, I'm going to do all this good stuff and you're going to do all this good stuff for me. So the landowner says, take your money and go. I wanted to pay the last one higher, the same as you. I have the right to do what I want with my money. Are you envious because I'm generous? I think it's so sad that so many Christians, myself included, can become so envious and jealous of God's grace and mercy and blessings. In fact, I hate it. I hate it that we can get jealous of God's grace towards others. I mean, how ugly is it that when somebody gets a win, maybe they experience healing, maybe they get a promotion, maybe they get a new job, maybe God just does something special in their life, How ugly is it that all we can do is is respond by getting jealous? So I want to ask you the question right now. Which group of workers in the parable do you resonate with most? Be honest. How many of you, when I brought up the topic of fairness, thought, hey, I, I, I totally agree. I've been feeling like I've been working hard and I've been doing all the right things, but I feel like the people around me are getting the blessings that I deserve. And here's my warning to you. If you stay in that mindset, the more you're going to feel cheated. And the more you're going to think life is unfair and the more bitter you're going to get toward your life and toward other people. I think the reason that we allow ourselves to stew in that place for so long is because we forget one really simple thing. At one point in our lives, we were all the five o'clock workers. At one point in our lives, we were all waiting in that marketplace for somebody to choose us. At one point in our lives, we didn't know where we were going. We didn't know what we were doing. But we were just trying to get paid and feel some kind of significance. And and, and the problem is that every road we went down to find it, there was a dead end. That is until this man, Jesus, showed up and, and he allowed us to work in his vineyard. He allowed us to work in his kingdom. And we got to receive his blessings and his love and his mercy and his compassion on our lives. I believe we need to step back and stop working for approval and start working from approval. It's not about what any of us has done. It's about what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. All you have to do is say yes to him and you can be a part of his kingdom. You can be a part of his love and his grace and his blessing on your life that only comes through him. But if you look at this story through the lens of fairness, I can guarantee you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be confused. It's going to bother the heck out of you. But if you look at it through the lens of grace, it'll empower you. It'll enable you to to want to go and do more for God's kingdom. Go and serve others more. Well, when you put yourself in the position of the 5 p.m. worker, you don't have to measure up anymore. I think God wants to move us from that 6 a.m. attitude to that 5 o'clock gratitude. And so here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Here are three things I'm going to challenge you to do. And the first is this. Stop trying to control the things you can't control. We're all going to face circumstances in our life that we can't do anything about. So instead of trying to force a change in situations that we don't have control of, instead, control what you can. Focus on the things you can do to bless the people in the world around you. The second thing I want to challenge you to do is to find opportunities to celebrate the good in your life and the good in others' lives. That means when somebody gets a promotion or they get an exciting opportunity, you congratulate them. Well, when they experience healing, you thank God with them. When they get the blessing of a, of a spouse or a child or a job or even a new pet, you celebrate it with them. And when you go back and you look at the blessings in your life, 
Stop comparing them to other people and just thank God for what you have. And the third thing I want to challenge you to do is to ask God to reinstate your trust in him. As long as we try to rely entirely on our efforts to get us where we want to be, we're going to be frustrated and disappointed. So so the better alternative is to put that trust in God and his plan for your life. And you can begin that process at any point. It's not going to happen overnight, but you can start that process right now. In fact, let's do it right now. Would you pray with me? Father, everyone here at some point in our lives are guilty of feeling down on ourselves, of, of, of wanting to stand in our room and look at the floor and cry, that's not fair. God, I'm sure all of us at some point in our lives are guilty of, of trying to compare our blessings to other people, that are guilty of being envious of the blessings in other people's life. God, I, there are even some of us in here that are guilty of trying to earn the blessings that you provide freely by just saying yes to you. And God, I just pray this morning that you would remove that spirit and you would remove those lies from our lives and let us know that all we have to do is reach out to you, to say yes to you, to trust in you, and the plans that you have for our lives will be so much more than the disappointment that we have when we try to do it ourselves. So God, help us to trust in you more. God, help us to let go of the things that are out of our control. And God, give us a, give us a spirit of gratitude and, and thanksgiving for your blessings on our lives and others' lives. God, every day renew us and transform us to look more like the image of your son. And God, thank you. Thank you for letting us work in your vineyard. Thank you for letting us work in your kingdom. What a blessing that is. Don't let us forget. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.